Thanks. So uh, I really appreciate uh, the invitation to speak here today. Um, I was talking to Chris about uh, what you guys would be most interested in and why he wanted me to, to speak. And uh, uh, I think it's because uh, for over the last four years, we've been out on the bleeding edge of, of uh, FinTech and um, uh, doing some pretty pioneering things. And specifically, what we've done is develop technology so that we can send money to strangers on the other side of the planet in the emerging markets, which isn't that interesting. But what's interesting is that uh, uh, they send it back with interest. So uh, you know, at the end of the day, our, our, the technology and all of financial services is built on risk and risk management. And uh, we've discovered, or really rediscovered, a way to, to do that using big data and community. So, but that's not what we set out to do. <clears throat> um, we started out just as kids from the suburbs didn't really have a pro problem with financial services. It worked pretty well for us. Uh, but we had employees all over the world. We had started several companies. And the employees kept coming to us asking for loans. And this, this made no sense to us. They were hardworking. They were, they were educated. They were highly, uh, highly employable. But they couldn't get credit. <clears throat> so this really surprised us. So we started digging into it. And we found that uh, here in the US, let's see here. I don't think we were planning to use this. Here in the US, um, there are great databases. If you want to do business with someone, especially a consumer, they sit in databases. You, you can figure out who they are. Do they exist? Are they who they say they are? And there's credit bureaus. And with those credit bureaus, you get a sense of the risk associated with them. So you have a very good, uh, well-functioning system. Of course, lots of room for improvement, as we heard from, from Douala, uh, but, but functioning pretty well. But the need is places like this, Bangalore. 300 million people in India moving into the emerging market middle class. Um, and for the most part, financial institutions have no idea how to do business with them. Or places like here, Bogota, Colombia, where uh, we have an operation. And uh, uh, the local credit bureau, uh, even for the very best borrows, the top decile, they're only uh, 80% accurate as to predicting whether or not they're, they're, they would repay a loan. Or places like here, Indonesia, where the economy is growing so fast, the middle class is growing so fast, that you have to allocate an extra hour or two to go between meetings. Because so many people have bought cars and mopeds in the last two years that, that travel just a few miles takes, takes hours. Or places like this, Manila, where we had a, 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 a team uh, working that was coming to us asking for, uh, uh, asking for credit. And uh, it made no sense to us. These are people who could literally quit their job at 10 o'clock in the morning and have another job by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Unemployment rate in, in Manila for, for people in the BPO industry is 0%. Um, so, so why is it that they can't get credit? It's because there aren't databases, there isn't a credit bureau. So we set out and said, you know, how can we solve this? How can we help the hundreds of millions of people moving into the middle class get access to, to financial services? How can we get others to trust them like we do? So we, st we figured, Matt, this, this, you know, how hard could this problem be? Uh, we started digging into it. <clears throat> and what we found was this problem was a little bit bigger than we had, had realized. Turns out that by 2030, uh, there'll be uh, 4.9 billion people who've joined the global economy, who've moved into the middle class. And almost all of them are essentially invisible to today's global financial system, uh, which is reflected in the fact that less than 5% of them actually have access to credit from, from traditional institutions. So, so we started to uh, realize this was a bigger problem than we, than, we, than we initially thought. So we started looking who else might be able to, to help us with this. And we come, came across the work of Professor Yunus, who started Grameen Bank. And what he did is pioneered a system, actually got a Nobel Prize for it, of getting credit to the bottom of the pyramid. And the way he did it is he used the community. And we were shocked at the, default, at the low default rates. It turns out when you involve the community in the underwriting process, it's incredibly efficient. So uh, we then went out, uh, sort of dug into an academic exercise and started talking to anyone in the world who knew anything about microfinance. And uh, 
Uh, it, it, we're based in New York, so a lot of microfinance professionals pass through there. We would grab them and we, we'd really pick their brain. And, and uh, uh, one of the things we learned was that uh, a lot of the, the cost associated with microfinance is the actual logistics, the meeting people face to face. And then also, when you're meeting people face to face, it's very hard to maintain uh, the quality because you know, your, your team is being instructed, they go out in the field, they interview people, uh, they're talking to the community. It's very expensive to administer, but incredibly efficient, no, no, no default. Um, what, but we also understood that this, this uh, tried to understand what is it about the community that makes it so effective. So we started talking to behavioral economists and computational anthropologists and, and understood that dynamic. Uh, we said, hey, wait a minute. If the community knows, maybe this is somehow reflected in the data. Everyone's getting a smartphone. So as we, as we dug into that, we discovered that this cus these customers, not just our, our customers in the Philippines and Mexico and Argentina and the Ukraine, places where we were doing business, but the middle class in general in emerging markets, they're heavy users of, of social networks and they're heavy users of, of smartphones. So smartphone growth is growing 32% year over year. Essentially, everyone's going to have a, a, a smartphone. Uh, by 2020. Um, and then social networks are actually heavier, there's heavier use in the emerging markets than here. Bogota, for example, has heavier use of social networks than New York City, even though New York City is, is a much larger city. So we said, wait a minute, maybe we can analyze this data and through looking at the data, simulate uh, the process that they use at microfinance where they involve the community. Maybe by understanding people's connections and interactions, we can, we can uh, use that same technique, but instead of deploying $50 billion manually at the bottom of the pyramid, instead deploy 10 times that to a group that has easily has 10 times the borrowing capacity, but do it all digitally. So we set out to, to, to launch Lendo. And Lendo really takes advantage of, of three big trends, which I think is affecting everyone who's trying to disrupt financial services. Uh, we call it SMAC. Uh, which uh, uh, goes for social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. Uh, I think analytics, we're going to look back five years from now and kind of laugh at that. I think uh, you know, some people call it big data, but I think analytics is just the first piece of it. It's really, uh, analytics tells you what's going on, but it's really about algorithms. And algorithms uh, uh, predict what's going to happen in the future, but even more important is algorithms can be used to influence what happens. So, so uh, we, we say, we use the A for... Uh, for algorithms, uh, and really our whole company is based on algorithms. We've got a, a team of PhDs who just build and analyze data so that we can manage risk so that our customers, the consumers who we're helping prove their identity and trustworthiness with their social footprint can, can access financial services, and so that our clients, financial institutions, can feel confident that by integrating our technology in their workflow, they can do customers, they can do business with people they wouldn't be able to do business with otherwise. Um, so uh, the, these technologies affect us. They allow us to deliver our service inexpensively. They allow us to, to, do, to deal with volumes of data that simply couldn't be dealt with a few years ago. Um, but these same technologies are affecting everyone. And we see that uh, coming across in five, five ways. One is the digitization of payments. <clears throat> and um, uh, what happens when things are digitalized is the costs disappear. So you know, take, for example, uh, um, if you were to go to Jamaica, they're very proud. They have a billboard that says, send $100 uh, across border for $8 fee. They're really excited that it's just $8 to send $100. Well, as those transfers get digitized, those will go to, go to, uh, to, to pennies. And we're seeing that with Gowalla uh, within the US borders. Um, yeah, the second, and we talked about it, and that was covered a little earlier, is the move to real time. And this is a big deal because, uh, as Denning talked about in, in sort of the lean, the lean movement, when you squeeze out those batches, when you squeeze out those delays, you also squeeze out an enormous amount of risk. Uh, and and you know, if you see a transaction just, just, just performed on your behalf two minutes ago, you know, if something's wrong, you're going to spot it right away. If you spot it a month later on your statement, it's too late. You know, it's it's you got to catch these things in real time, and uh, and you're going to see the entire financial services sector move from this sort of mainframe, uh, mini PC oriented what we call platform one, platform two world into this real time cloud based uh, world. 
which opens up all sorts of new business models. Uh, it, and it also opens up choice. You know, when you can switch, move things around quickly, when it's all available 24 hours a day online, uh, you, you get more, more choice, um, which means that things, uh, services that used to be businesses start to become commoditized. They go further down on the, on the stack. So, you can, so you're going to see innovators plugging and playing and uh, 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 deploying new services because things like money transfer or things like asset allocation become services. They become, become commoditized in that you can plug into them. And then the other, the other big trend is supernationalization. And we've seen this because of the internet. We're seeing it even more now because of, of smartphones and, uh, and access to the internet through, through the phone. But we've seen it in other industries like music. You know, it used to be that uh, or, or even Netflix. It used to be, oh, well, I can only access um, music from my radio station, which is, which is local. And then, then all of a sudden the internet comes along and you can pull things down from all over the world. Well, the same thing is happening in financial services. The internet doesn't particularly care about geographic borders. And financial services is built on this legacy thought of you're going to a branch, and your branch sits in a jurisdiction, and it's regulated by the local regulators. I mean, who, who governs a transaction when the, 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 for example, a loan, when the person receiving the loan is in the Philippines, the money is coming from someone in London, the co-guarantor is in Singapore, and the financial institution is based in Mauritius. I mean, the regulators' heads are going to explode, but these types of transactions become incredibly easy to do as more and more of this becomes uh, 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 on, the, on this next platform, on this, what we call the SMAC platform. The other big change we see is, is just the sheer volume of data. When you think about the legacy systems, you know, the data was down, down here in the mainframes in these sort of big databases. And databases are relatively easy to work with. Uh, in the future, or in, this, in, in, the, in the, uh, the world of mobile social, it's out at the edges. It's in the network itself, how you're interacting with people. Uh, and it's massive amounts. In fact, more data uh, was, uh, was created in two days recently than all the data created for all of mankind up to 2003. So just massive, massive amounts of, of data. Uh, and, and with that, new opportunities for, for new services, uh, uh, risk management. So what did we do? We basically, we had a theory that your extended community could be used to manage risk very efficiently. Uh, and the first thing we did to validate this is we talked to uh, some, some retired bankers. We, we were all excited. We are like, we're using Facebook. We're using LinkedIn. We're using your mobile activity on your phone. Um, you know, aren't, we, aren't we incredible? And, and uh, the, this retired banker said to us, he says, oh, yeah. Yeah, I recognize that. Said, what are you talking about? We're using Facebook. He said, oh, you know, I recognize that from the 50s. Uh, and he told us about the first time he got a loan, uh, the loan officer knew his father, and the loan officer's son played football with his brother, and he knew the community came from, and he knew his reputation, and it was about his standing in the community that allowed him to get that first loan. And he said, that's how lending worked for hundreds and hundreds of years back to biblical time. All you're doing is now you're doing it at a, at a global scale, algorithmically. This is, this is normal finance. So that, that gave us an idea that we were on the right track. And then the second banker we talked to said, oh yeah, JP Morgan would recognize this. And we said, the company? He's like, no, no, Mr. You know, Mr. JP Morgan. And he directed us to uh, some, some dialogue at the turn of the century where JP Morgan was asked, what's more important, loan to asset ratio or loan to income? And he said, the character of the man. And the second banker said, all you're doing is you're measuring character, but you're doing it algorithmically. So, so we thought, okay, maybe, maybe we're on the right track. We were also inspired by some other academic studies for things like, uh, from the fields of epidemiology. And what that showed was that your community can influence and be used to predict things like likelihood to smoke or take up smoking or sexual promiscuity or ob obesity, even things like uh, loneliness and happiness. So what we did is we set up three lending companies to prove this to ourselves and to build our algorithms. And we knew we needed to do this way because we had, uh, we had started, up, we had started a, a big data company in the mid-2000s where we were analyzing large data sets for hedge funds, and we knew that the key to machine learning is having the training sets. And uh, we tried to convince some, some banks, we said, hey, we want to make a bunch of bad loans to strangers so that we can build some algorithms, and they, they weren't really keen on that idea. So, so, so uh, we set up first our lending company in the Philippines, 
and um, uh, uh, launched that in March 2011. We did our first loan in March 2011. It was a lot of fun waiting to see if any money actually came back. That was a, a big, sending the money out was a big day, but getting that first money back uh, was, was really, really exciting. Uh, and it was working. Um, uh, then we said, well, we need to prove it works in multiple geogra geographies. So we launched in Colombia, and then we launched in Mexico. And what we found was uh, that it works that your behavior online, but also important is your behavior of the community and how they interact with you, so, and your friends, your friends' friends, and even your friends' friends' friends are predictive and can be used very efficiently to, to manage risk and understand character. So uh, there's a little visualization of this. Uh, this is a you know, sort of standard clustering through, uh, uh, through an application called Gephi. And what you can see down here in this lower corner, you see this little red cluster. And these are, these are bad borrowers uh, that are mathematically uh, connected to each other by the strength of their, their connection. And what you can see is they're clearly grouped together. Um, and, uh, and you can see that there's a couple examples of that. And what that means is that if a new borrower comes in who's socially close to them, mathematically, there's a high probability that they're, that they're gonna end up default. And, and, and actually, there's a blue dot in that cluster, and uh, uh, that, that one, from a risk management standpoint, you can say that's probably likely to default. So you can use that to manage risk. But even in places where it looks like they're kind of all mixed together, like this red cluster right here, uh, it turns out when you render it in three dimensions, that's actually a very distinct separate cluster. So visually, what, what you're seeing here is uh, there's something to this birds of a feather flocking together. So we mathematically, ma mathematically analyze that, and that's a, that's a, those homophily-based algorithms are a core, uh, core element to our, to our data science. Another thing we found is there's linguistic grouping. So this is just a sort of standard off-the-shelf uh, linguistic clustering, and um, you can see different topics, different writing styles sort of clustered together, and that, like that yellow cluster there. Um, and it turns out that uh, that's also a cluster of, of bad loans. So the way you talk, the, the messages that you send uh, is also predictive. So you know, for these hundreds of millions of people, which to traditional banks are invisible and unknown, or if they wanted to do business with them, they'd have to have a costly person interview them, get to know them, get to know the community, uh, or happen to already be part of the community. Basically, it's cost prohibitive for them to do business with this group because they have no data. Uh, we're able to use this constant chatter and interaction online as a, as a substitute. And our, and our hope uh, is that uh, if we stay on track, that we can economically empower a billion people uh, by, within 10 years. So um, what are we? We've, uh, we? Our mission, economically empower the emerging market middle class. We started this in January 2011. Uh, our algorithms are, are based on, on actual lending. We, we recently opened this up. In fact, January 20th, we announced that uh, this is now available not just to our beta customers, not just to our own lending entities, uh, which we've, we've since sold, but to any financial institution anywhere in the world. And I'm glad to say that we're, we're as of uh, yesterday, we had over 100 institutions in process at various stages, including uh, five institutions that agreed to work with us just in the last week, week and a half. Um, and, and, uh, and I'm also excited to say that because we can deploy this as a cloud solution, some of those institutions are already live um, with, our, with our social verification service or our score service. Just one last technical dive, and I want to I open it up to questions. How does it work? So what we do is we take these billions of, of data points, um, we break them down into to variables, we further break those down into features, and then we, off of those, build, uh, build models uh, that can be used to predict, is this person who they say they are? Are they employed where they say they are? Uh, um, do they live where they say they are? Uh, uh, sort of a verification. And what is the willingness to repay based on their character and their community and the way they behave online? And from that, uh, today, there are people getting credit all over the world. There are, you know, there are literally students there, uh, that would not be in school right now had it not been for the $400 loan that uh, was facilitated because of the technology. Um, so with that, I'd uh, open it up to questions.
Any? Yes. So this is fascinating. Um, and I'm really interested in the subject because um, I was looking at uh, you know, setting up a micro lending venture, but much more domestically. Um, and actually tapping into sort of the unbanked, assuming that they would have access to smartphones. So obviously you're doing this, you've got sort of a threshold probably for who you want to uh, target. So it, it, it's likely people who um, are upwardly mobile to some extent. <coughs> what advice would you give someone who's looking to do this uh, in a very domestic way? Um, probably working with, um, you know, it could be someone who has been in business for a while, it could be a peanut a cart owner who's looking to sort of scale up. Um, would you recommend um, using sort of the Muhammad Lewis philosophy combined with some algorithmic techniques to lend to these people and sort of tap into the community? How challenging would it be to sort of get something like that up in the Well, well um, there's the technical side and then there's the regulatory side. And the U.S. is its own special morass of regulation. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm going to first address the technical side. Um, uh, there's a company called Vouch here in the US, uh, which is using, it's mobile first, which I think is, is the right way to go uh, to squeeze out costs. Uh, and it, it involves actual vouching. Um, we started out doing some vouching. What we found was the data itself uh, was predictive, and you didn't have to have the actual vouch. But in the US, if you're doing this, I think the, something a little closer to the, the Professor Eunice's uh, vouching is probably uh, easier to deploy from a regulatory standpoint than a pure data approach, which is what, what, what we use. But both, both, I think, can be very effective and, and, and scale. So, yes? Two, two questions and one quick question. Are the loans, are they denominated in local currency or U.S. dollars? The, the loans are, uh, well, we facilitate any, yeah. any type of loan, but the loans are uh, uh, administered by the local financial institution and in the local currency. Okay. And then I just had a follow-up question. Um, I mean, this is, obviously, if you're going doing it algorithmically, it's relatively, it's, you know, it's blind uh, just by, it's going by the numbers, but... What happens if you, um, this is very hypothetical, but if you, in certain areas, there are actually, you know, like the algorithms tend to choose favor people of certain demographic, you know, socio-demographic factors, and that perception-wise, it looks like it's favoring or uh, disfavoring certain groups. Like, it's just, the reality is different, but the perception is different. Yeah, that, that is a great question. So, so uh, and, and I think the root of the question is, in the U.S., we have fair lending laws. Um, to make sure that everyone's getting equal access to, to credit. And in the U.S., the problem we have is that uh, we might exclude somebody. We, society, might exclude someone from a loan. And we're in a default situation where almost everyone can access credit. When I go home tonight, there'll be credit card solicitations in my mailbox. We're operating in parts of the world where the default situation is no one can get credit. <clears throat> so, so the regulators and uh, uh, the community is really excited that we've figured out a way to extend some credit. <clears throat> and, and it's very favorably received. Um, uh, but I think when you deploy this in a place like the US, you have to be very careful to make sure that you're not using it as a justification to exclude credit. You should only be using the technology to extend credit or better credit to people who otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to do it. Um. Uh, so hi. Um, so I'm I'm looking to do something pretty much similar to this for small and medium enterprises in Mexico, and I from what you told us, I understand that initially you had to put some money in first to like kind of train your algorithms, and then from there you were able to kind of prove the validity of what it was actually throwing. Right. Uh, so how much time did it took? took you to actually train those algorithms on how much lending you had to do in order to actually have a good case to actually show this? So we, we uh, invested four years to get the data. And it takes time because it turns out that uh, people don't repay their loans faster. So you know, we, we would have uh, our average loan tenure was nine months. Um, and uh, you need that, that time to, to see how they, they repay. Uh, so we invested about four years and $20 million to, to build the core, the core algorithms. Uh, the good news is, is that we expose it as a cloud-based service, so you don't need to do that. In fact, no financial institution in the world needs to do that. They can now use our service and build on top of it and innovate with things like the product definition or innovate on the, uh, or, or the regulation or the marketing or the customer experience. Uh, and then the, the algorithmic part is now available 
via the cloud. Okay, and just a follow-up, what, what buyers are you finding to actually convince? I, I work for Scotiabank in Mexico for a long time, um, so I know if I go with the, the head of retail, he might say, yeah, it sounds interesting, but I don't know he will actually put his money in it. So how are you managing to actually do those sales? Gr great question. And we're working with Scotiabank uh, in Colombia, where we're administering credit cards yeah. t together. Uh, the, uh, the nice thing is that we have historic data that shows that... Um, uh, using our technology, there are pe there are people who would have re been rejected, who uh, now can get a loan and and those loans are profitable. But also, you can use our technology to show that uh, in places outside the U.S. that loans that they would have issued, we could have flagged and said no, th this this loan is not going to repay. So uh, the the answer is the data is how, how you convince them. And having this four years of historic data allows us to get these 100 financial institutions which, are, which we're in discussions with uh, to, to get over the hump or hopefully get over the hump. Thank you. Yep. Yes? How are you combating uh, fraudulent accounts uh, that are set up on social networks? Sure, okay, great question. Um, fraud. Uh, it, is, fraud is a, obviously a big problem in financial services, and uh, e Elon Musk once said to me, he said, uh, fraud is not a defect rate, it's, uh, it's, it will grow to take over your entire business. It's a cancer. Um, so so uh, uh, it's a very, very important issue. Um, what, what we found is um, when you include this vast amount of data, uh, you can have some fraud in that someone in their head could say, you know what, I'm just not going to pay it back. I, and I'm going into this transaction with the intent to not pay it back. So that's one type of fraud, and you can have that. What you can't have is scalable fraud because there's so much data. You know, you, every single individual is connected to hundreds of individuals. And you know, their Dunbar number is about 150 people. Uh, so between those, their, their weak connections and their strong connections, those are hundreds of people. Those look a certain way. But those people are also connected to hundreds of, of people, so so who are then connected to hundreds of people. So you, you, when you look at an individual, you're really looking at a community of ten thousand or more people and how they interact. They cluster certain ways. You probably know you know them already through other transactions if you're if you're in financial services. So with that vast amount of data, you can't. We've haven't seen any examples of of meaningful scalable fraud. Uh, because we take the, bur the, the with big data, you take the hurdle of fraud and you turn it into uh, a hurdle of massive conspiracy. And even that massive conspiracy starts to show itself after you get these, the, these you get these clusters. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. So I think right now your lenders are financial institutions. So do you uh, intend to offer in one day that the future like the actually have lender coming from common people? Well, I will, I will uh, 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 point out that um, we get an inbound inquiry from a peer-to-peer -peer lending company about every two days. And uh, I don't know that if the, the banks realize this, but there are teams working in garages in, in you know, at pretty much any country. Uh, and I think I'm pretty geographically familiar with the planet. Th there's been some countries where I've had to pull out the map. Um, so. Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, we, you know, we we have a, a Bitcoin, uh, some Bitcoin deployments, where they're using us uh, on the identity side. Um, so yes, we absolutely intend in to do that. And and along those lines, um, you know, we ask about the, this question of of identity. Uh, we just got approved by a central bank for a pilot, where they're using this these algorithms uh, as a replacement uh, for KYC AML for small dollar transactions. So I think you're going to see a lot of innovation uh, built on top of this, or is as our service is really just another cloud service that innovators can plug into, you'll absolutely see uh, innovation in the peer-to-peer -peer space. OK, I think this is the last question. Yes? So there's fraud of different kinds, but there's also SEO. So you, know, the, you can have all this data science about the past four years, but there's a back reaction from people getting access to credit through something that they now that they have on their phone. So have you thought much about, uh, at scale, what is it, how it might affect people's propensity to message each other, who they're willing to call, what, it, what it's like to have disposable or non-disposable messaging channels? I mean, this is a scary way to me to think about how it, it might uh, 
impact the way we use technology, knowing that the creditors are watching. Uh, and you know, there's it's a little different than just directly, did I pay my loans back? I think we're all comfortable knowing that if we if we stiff one guy, I might everyone's going to know. You know, what, what what's your sort of thinking around that? that that's a great question, and and we we think it's it's an important one. Uh, everything we do is opt in, so our customers. Uh, can't get credit, or if they can get credit, it's extremely expensive. So they choose to share this information so that they can they can access credit. But I think that it, there is a scary side to this. Uh, you know, what you don't want to see is financial institutions sort of sneaking around and gathering this information and using it in ways that we don't understand. It's it's very it's, which is one of the reasons we designed the business to be consumer facing. Um, you know, our business is to help consumers prove their identity and trusty trustworthiness using the activity that they're, that they're already doing. But I think at the end of the day, uh, I, I think back to my mother who, who told me growing up that uh, you will be judged by the company you keep. And I think that what we'll see uh, in the data and, and as society evolves, that just like uh, hundreds of years ago or just like when I grew up, who you hang out with and how you interact with them is going to be part of how, you, how you're judged. Thank you.